So this is reflecting on Romans part two. This will be the, the final part of um, our kind of recap of, of Romans. Last week, Craig did an actual recap of Romans, went through the, the outline of the book and talked about some major themes. What we're going to do today is I'm going to do the, for a few minutes, I'm going to talk about uh, something that stood out to me from Romans. That was a question we've been asked by some in the congregation. What, what stood out to you guys? What really um, caught your attention as you studied Romans? So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about something that stood out to me. Craig's going to talk for a few moments about something that um, stood out to him. And then um, we'll have some time, I think, to ask you all you know, for any thoughts about Romans. So I'm going to pray, and then, and then we'll jump in. Our God and Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the riches of the book of Romans, which we've enjoyed for the past um, year plus. We pray that today's reflection would even deepen our, our love for this portion of your word. We pray that the, the grace of the book of Romans would really saturate our lives, that it would permeate our thinking, our desires, our, our actions, our words. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So what I'm going to talk about today, without trying, without, hopefully without losing everyone and, and myself, is uh, the cosmic scope of salvation. So that's something that stood out to me as we've studied Romans. I need a sip of water real quick. Um, the, the sal you know, Romans announces an, an amazing salvation. You know, Paul opens the book, the gospel is the power of God for salvation. And that salvation that Paul unpacks in the book of Romans is very surprising in many different ways. I mean, we could spend the entire time talking about how this salvation announced in Romans, which is the, the biblical gospel of uh, Jesus Christ, how it's surprising in many ways. But um, today, I just want to focus on this aspect of it that comes out in Romans, the cosmic scope of salvation. And before I, I take you to a, a key passage on that, I just want to talk about a common misunderstanding about salvation. So this is something, uh, when I say common, it's common for us as um, American Christians, although it's probably true in other cultures as well. It, it's so common, I think at times we don't realize that it's maybe uh, our understanding of salvation is sometimes deficient. And so le let, me, um, let me unpack that a bit in, in two, two parts. The common misunderstanding about salvation that I'm talking about is we, we tend to think of salvation, number one, in otherworldly terms, and then number two, in spiritualized terms. So what do I mean by otherworldly terms? Uh, what does that mean? What does it sound like? Um, it goes like this. Salvation is about going somewhere pleasant after you die. So in this view of salvation, um, it, it's very common to talk about going to heaven. Okay? Uh, common e evangelistic question. Do you know where you will go after you die? So... You, you all have heard this kind of thing, right? Um, it's very common. Um, it shows up a lot in hymns. So hymnals can be very dangerous. Hymnals are often fall, full of bad theology. Contemporary songs don't fare much better on this issue. <laughs> but let me give you a couple hymns. Um, this one I don't believe is in our hymnal. Uh, this world is not my home. Does anybody know that one? Let me just give you a few lines from that in the first verse. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's door. 
and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. And then part of the refrain, oh Lord, you, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? And then the final verse, just up, so that, that's, that's a key, just up in glory land will live eternally. So it, in this hymn, this world, it says, is not my home. Now there's a way we could assert that that's true and in line with biblical teaching. But, but from the rest of the hymn, you know, longing to go to this place after I die that's not this world. That, that, that's the kind of language I'm talking about. Another hymn. Um, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling by Charles Wesley. Now, this overall is a great hymn, and, um, but there's a, a, it's, it's in our hymnal. Uh, there's a, a verse, Finish then, speaking to the Lord, Finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee, changed from glory to glory. So, so far, very good. Changed from glory to glory, Till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. I love that last part, you know, lost in love and wonder and praise. But did you notice, till in heaven we take our place. And then, um, come Christians, join to sing, which is also in our hymnal. Uh, one of the lines in there, on heaven's blissful shore, his goodness will adore, singing forevermore. Alleluia. Amen. So again, heaven's blissful shore. Now, it's a hymn and that's poetic language, but, but I do think it's, it's conveying this idea that salvation is, is otherworldly. It's about taking us to some other place at some point. Um, this language of going to heaven is almost entirely absent from the Bible. I mean, you, you pretty much never find anything like that in the Bible. There's a few places where there's, there's language related to that. But you never hear the apostles, when they're, when they're preaching the gospel, they never say to people, do you know where you're going to go after you die? Do you want to know how to get to heaven? Um, that's just not, not how they talk about it. It's not how Jesus talks about it. Um, Michael Goheen, he's a, a theologian, he summarized this view. He says, in this view, salvation is God's work of snatching individuals from this corrupted world into another one. And so, in this view, this physical world that we all live in right now, it's, it's unimportant to God. He, he really doesn't care a whole lot about it. And, um, you know, I once was at a church service where they had a guest musicians and they, they sang this song titled, It's All Gonna Burn. And they just kept repeating that over and over again. It's all gonna burn. So why care? It's all gonna burn. So that's the otherworldly idea of salvation that, that's very common. The second um, aspect of it, a, a spiritualized understanding of salvation. And here's what I mean by that. Um, in this common misunderstanding, salvation, the salvation that comes to us through Jesus Christ is focused on the soul. So in this view, there's a sharp division, body, soul. Salvation is about the soul. Um, the, the body is kind of a necessary evil for the present time, but, but God really is uh, not interested in your body. He's, he cares about your soul. And so in this view, you know, the body is a prison. And we kind of talk like this sometimes as Christians that we just long for that day when we will be free from our bodies. And some of that's understandable, you know, especially if you're living with chronic pain, if you're living with um, disease and illness, you know, that your body is just this constant um, reminder of that pain. But... Um, in this view, salvation is about liberating us from our physical existence so that we can kind of float up into heaven. Um, another hymn. Again, remember I said hymns can be dangerous. We, we don't sing this one, but um, I'll Fly Away. Do you all know that, that song? Um, verse 1, 
Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. So there's that heavenly shore again. I'll fly away. Verse 2, when the shadows of this life have gone, I'll fly away. Like a bird from prison bars has flown, I'll fly away. Now again, it's poetic language, and I'm not sure exactly what the author of this hymn intended um, to say, but it sounds a lot to me like um, this is about being liberated from physical existence. I mean, like a bird from prison bars has flown, so released from this prison to go to this other world. So it's a, a spiritual, spiritualized view of salvation. Um, there's an ancient Chinese proverb that says, if you want to know about water, don't ask a fish. And again, this view is so common that I think we, you know, we're so accustomed to talking in ways similar to this, um, you know, that salvation is about going to heaven after you die, um, that we don't realize sometimes that it's, it's not quite what the Bible presents to us. And so let me talk about uh, where in Romans we see a, a cosmic, um, the cosmic scope of salvation. Uh, Romans 8. Uh, I'll read a couple verses. Romans 8, beginning in verse 18. Um, just real briefly, Paul says here, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. So, again, Paul's saying, we looked at this a long time ago. Paul's saying, our future glory in Christ is so amazing that even the creation, the non-human creation, is just, um, as, as one author put it, waiting on tiptoe for, for us to, to enter into that glory. And we have to ask, why? Why does Paul use this, this very emotionally charged language, personifying creation, waiting on tiptoe for us to enter into our future glory in Christ. Why? Why is creation so eager for, for that to happen? And Paul's answer in, in Romans 8 is that the goal of God's plan of salvation is cosmic renewal. So cosmic renewal. Um, the plot line of the Bible can really be divided into four movements. Um, creation, number one, the fall, or you could say corruption of creation, uh, movement number two, movement number three, redemption, and then the final one, we often say consummation or something like that. We could say cosmic renewal. So creation, corruption, redemption, cosmic renewal, and Paul talks about that uh, going on in, in the passage. He says, you know, creation's waiting, and here's why. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So notice, the non-human creation, Paul says, in the present, subjected to futility, which he, he goes on to talk about as, as some kind of bondage to uh, corruption or decay. But the future, he says, for the non-human creation, all that we're a part of this as well, human and non-human creation, is renewal, set free, Paul says, renewed, restored. The, the renewal of, of the whole earth, non-human creation, human beings, is a key part of God's plan. And, and Paul opens a window onto that here. God has not given up on his creation. So, you know, that, that misunderstanding about salvation, that it's this otherworldly hope, basically says, who cares about this world? Because it's all going to burn. And, but Paul is saying God hasn't given up on his world. Um, this physical world is important to God. And, and one day, 
he is going to heal it and make it whole. That's a, a basic meaning of salvation, to, to mend what is broken, to heal what is, um, what is sick and make it whole. And, and our salvation, the salvation of human beings, salvation of men and women, is a part of God's cosmic renewal. So we tend to think of salvation strictly in like individual terms, like we're the center of it. Um, I, I think the biblical picture is if you, if you think of two circles, concentric circles, and the, the outer circle is, you know, there's a label on it, cosmic renewal. There's, there's a smaller circle inside there that's salvation of humans. Our, our salvation, our rescue, our redemption in Christ is a part of God restoring what was lost and corrupted at the fall. And so salvation is not otherworldly. It, it, it's about this world. And salvation is not about souls flying to heaven. So Paul goes on to talk about this. He says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And then, he, and then he says, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons. And he, he tells us what he means by adoption as sons. The redemption of our bodies. And then notice what he says at the beginning of verse 24. For in this hope, we were saved. Ho in what hope? The redemption of our bodies, which is just shorthand for resur physical resurrection from the dead. Paul says this is, this is like key to our hope. This is, this is a central aspect of, of our hope in Christ is that our bodies, these things, these, these decaying, aging things will be raised in, in power and glory, that our bodies will be renewed along with the rest of the physical creation. And so, um, you know, the redemption of our bodies, the resurrection is a, a healing of the, the division caused by death. So death separates body and soul. That's part of the reason it's so catastrophic. It, it's so contrary to God's design for us as human beings. He created us as embodied souls. We've talked about that. I'm not going to repeat all that. But, but death is this, this um, separation, resurrection, reunites what, what God created to be a, a, a whole body and soul. And so according to Paul, the, the salvation we, we possess now, the, the fullness of the salvation that, that we long for, that we anticipate, that we pray for, is a salvation that means embodied existence on this earth. Now, I should say it's, it's resurrection bodies, so not exactly these bodies, and it's a renewed earth, so not the, the earth as it is now, but it will be a physical earth. I mean, there will be dirt. <laughs> um, it will be a, a physical earth world. Our future, as we think about our future as Christians, is not I'll fly away like a bird escaping from the birdcage. It's this world in, in flesh and blood bodies. And there's a lot that, you know, what does all that mean? So what? what? Now what? There's a lot, and I don't have time to unpack all that. I'll just throw out a couple things real quick. You have to work these out. <laughs> We don't have time today, but um, the gospel's bigger than we realize. We tend to just focus on, on the individuals, and, um, but we have to understand that the gospel is, is cosmic in scope. Um, and if we don't get that or if we ignore it, we tend to reduce the gospel to private religious beliefs. You know, the gospel is something that helps me in my life it might not help you. You might need, you know, something else. But no, the gospel is about what God's doing, has done and is doing to this whole world, including men and women whom he invites to receive uh, the, this salvation. So the gospel is bigger. 
this has things to say about the, the breadth and the scope of the mission of the church. I can't unpack that right now. It has implications for how we view what we do with our lives right here and now. How we see, um, it, it says there's something significant about our day-to-day -day lives and, and the vocations we have, the relationships God has put us into. Um, they mean something, they're important, it's not all going to burn. Um, there's a lot that could be said about that, but my time's up and Craig's going to come now and talk about what stood out to him. I'm still absorbing, I mean, nice small thing, um, cosmic scope of salvation. Um, I, I think related to that is um, something that stuck out to me was God's pursuit of peace. And I mentioned, um, I think, sometime, I can't remember when I said what, but at some point you come to the end of a book and you see something and you think, oh, if we could just start over again. And I was preaching on the text in Romans 16, and um, I don't have slides, just so you know, and so, I, but I want to take you through a survey of something. So if you want to dig out your Bibles, I'll have you look at a few verses. But um, in Romans 16, I came to verse 1620, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And so there we are, nearing the end of the book. And there's this title for God that's only used five times in the Bible, the God of peace. And, you know, we're finishing up Romans and I found myself saying, well, wait a minute, does it talk about peace in Romans? And we know that it does. I've read the terms, I've preached the sermons on it, but hadn't seen the connections there of what was going on in this theme of peace. And especially that God is the God of peace, that he characterizes himself that way. Peace is something that describes who he is and what he brings. And then, well, how does that relate to what he's doing in the world? And so it's kind of fascinating then to just see that the book of Romans is really bookended by the theme of peace. As we think of this cosmic renewal that um, Ryan has talked about, that's all throughout scripture that salvation's bringing, one aspect of that cosmic renewal, both in us and in the world, is that we would be at true peace. And that's fascinating. Um, and so Romans is bookended by this title, and then Paul talks about peace 10 times. But if you want to go to the beginning of the book, Romans 1, 7, it lays it out right away. I just think as we kind of hear these things, we can just marinate on them, and then um, we'll, we'll hear from you all as well. But notice how he starts in Romans 7. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, as we talked about in our kind of overview last week, Romans moves into a description of fallen humanity. And so if you look over in chapter 2, the next time that he talks about peace is there in that description of what's wrong now because of Adam's sin. And in chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, it says there, there will be one of two things. First of all, there will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. So on one side, because of evil doing, because of sin in the fall, what characterizes it? Tribulation or affliction, hardship, uh, which can be both personal and it can also be cosmic. We think of the upheaval of the world often described as tribulations that um, are happening. Um, so tribulation and distress for every human being. But then notice on the flip side, but glory, honor, and peace. Peace for whom? For everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. So, so that's the foundational thing. The state of sin brings about distress and tribulation. The state of righteousness brings about glory, which was talked about there, but peace as a part of that glory. 
And then, as he continues to describe fallen humanity's condition, look in uh, chapter 3, verse 16. So this is the state we find ourselves in apart from Christ. In their paths are ruin and misery. And then verse 17, and the way of peace they have not known. Isn't that a fascinating description of a fallen humanity? Um, I think it's a, an amazing description of what we so often still experience until the renewal of all things is this way of peace of what it would be like to be related in perfect peace with God, perfect peace with humanity, and perfect peace with all of creation. It's something that we have not known. <laughs> it's foreign to our fallen existence in Romans 3. And so that first section of verses kind of lays out what the problem is. But then as we know, as Romans unfolds, what happens? Then we move to God's solution, which perfectly counters um, the entire problem. And so kind of the key pivotal changing verse is Romans 5.1, where he's talking about, remember, being justified by faith, just as Abraham was. He says in Romans 5.1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's that most important peace that comes onto the scene. Because of God's work in Christ, peace is established between us and God. And we, now this way of peace we're beginning to know as he's made our relationship with him right through the work of Jesus. But it doesn't just stop there. It goes on because that peace with God is now going to be flowing out of us and affecting our existence in this world. And so as we continue on, the next place that we come to peace is Romans 8. Romans 8 is saying God has completely changed our position in Christ and we no longer are under death, sin, and the law, but instead have life in the spirit. And notice what that's characterized. Romans um, 8, starting in verse 5. Well, um, I think I might just have verse 6 here. For to set the mind on flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Um, as we orient our thinking and experience towards the things of the spirit, what it brings about in us is an understanding of this peace that we've been brought into by Jesus' work. And so that's something that's taking place within us. And then we come to Romans 14, where he says this peace that God is working out between us and him. And then as he's working out by his spirit to help us grow in our experience of it, we become people who with one another are bringing about that shalom, that peace in our relationships. It doesn't mean that we're peace fakers where, oh, everything's okay. It means as we follow Jesus' way, we actually start to bring reconciliation and restoration as we both correct and forgive and move toward each other. So in Romans 14, verse 17, it reminds us what this kingdom of God that God has brought us into is really all about. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking, these, these ideas about the Christian life that we might have, but instead it's about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. I think that goes back to what Roman, uh, what, not Romans, but Ryan talking about Romans. Romans, Ryan, um, was talking about with the cosmic renewal of all things. We tend to have too small of a view of salvation that says the kingdom of God is about forgiveness of sins, which is true and has brought us vertical peace. But notice that when Paul describes what the kingdom of God is actually all about. It's about righteousness, which has been given to us now by Christ, and he's helping us to grow in by the Spirit, becoming living more rightly. And then also peace, heaven's peace, breaking in upon us, and heaven's joy breaking in upon us. That's what the kingdom of God is really all about. And I'm just confessing to you all that until I came to Romans 16, 20, peace was just a word that... I would make fun of in things about um, Miss Universe contests or whatever, Miss Congeniality, world peace. Like it was just this trite thing that people would just say as a nice idea, but then realizing God is the 
God of peace, and peace is something that's at the core of what this cosmic renewal is, maybe I need to think more about that. The kingdom is actually a kingdom of righteousness and peace and joy. And so what does that mean? Well, continue on two verses down in Romans 14. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. What orients our relationships with one another here in the church is how can I pursue peace with you in the midst of our differences, in the midst of needing reconciliation, in the midst of all the chaos of this world. How can when I stand before you and look at you, my thought be about let's pursue kingdom things, which one of those is peace. And if that sounds overwhelming, then the, the last three verses that deal with peace in Romans are all about how this is what God is going to do. Um, if you move on to Romans 15, 13, here's his prayer wish as he's wrapping up the book and really building to his climax. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. You notice that where the spirit of God is bringing about the kingdom of God in our lives, part of what the spirit is bringing is an experience of peace. Then you move down to Romans 15, We think Paul's landing the plane. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. And then, oh wait, I forgot. There are also things you need to be aware of, of people that are causing division uh, among you with doctrinal things. Let me leave you with this final note, Romans 16, 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So those are the 10 instances of peace in Romans. And for me, my view of peace was far too small. What does that mean as we think about it? Why is that significant? Well, I think when we see how important of a concept this is to God, that he calls himself the God of peace, that it, it, it adds another lens to how we view our experience in this world. We may tend to view our experience in this world primarily through the lens of sin. And, and that's true, true. We live in a fallen world. But one of the consequences of that sin is a lack of peace. And it's just been eye-opening to me to realize how much I live my day not experiencing peace. Think about everything that you worry about and everything that you fear. Isn't it somehow related to there's a lack of being at peace about something? There, there's deadlines pressing in on our jobs. There's chaos of how are we ever going to accomplish these things. There's a world that's in conflict. There's creation that's groaning and in chaos and earthquakes breaking out and floods happening. Like peace in this cosmos is not something that we experience. There is hurt and harm that we feel because of conflict between us and other people or other people in conflict and it spills over onto us and causes all kinds of pain and difficulty. We lay our heads down at night and we may wonder about the things that we've done and what God thinks of us. It's a, it's a sign of lack of peace with God, even though he's made peace with us through the work of Christ to fully experience and know and be assured of everything is okay because I have peace with God. And then to know what it would be like to be in relationship with one another and not be second guessing, what did I say? Or what do they think of me? Or how are we ever gonna get through this? But just in every word we speak that there would be just peace and flourishing. Um, you start to realize again, how big this salvation is that God has attained for us. And all those lacks of peace make us long for that cosmic renewal. When we spend eternity with the God of peace and know what it's like to be at peace with him, with one another, and with all of creation in a renewed heavens and new earth. I think it just adds a, a layer of depth to the salvation um, that God has accomplished. And then it helps us prioritize things in our lives, right? If this is about, if this is what God is about doing, then wow, how am I pursuing that 
as I talk with other people? How am I pursuing that as I relate to this creation? How am I pursuing that as I think about what God has done for me in Christ and the peace that that, that accomplished? So for me, it's been this weighty thing that I feel like I'm just starting to dip my toe into um, that I didn't see till the end of Romans. And uh, it's also in the Bible and other places, go figure. So great. Well, those were the two things. Um, hey, what, as, as you think back of R Romans, what was surprising to you? What stood out? Um, those were two things we wanted to share. Um, now we wanna open it up to you all of, it doesn't need to be what's been surprising. Um, you don't need to have created any slides. I was trying to model that, just kidding. Um, but just anything that's been edifying to you as we've looked at Romans afresh over the last year, and Ryan says 42 sermons, I say 41. Just kidding, you're right about whatever. Okay, cool. <laughs> so, great. Um, Eamon, Mike, uh, Mike needs the mic. So <laughs> Eamon's going to be moving the mic around. You're welcome to come up here too. If Hello. You want. Is it just on? Uh, it will All be right. as you talk. Mike on the mic here. Okay, so relating to your 1419 comment about pursuing peace with one another, it's been real helpful to me to hear that like God's okay with our differences on certain issues in the church. And like the goal is not that we all agree 100% on every single thing. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, like Romans 14, 15 versus also like Galatians 2, you know, where like Paul, like welcoming one another, accepting, not dis not quarreling over disputable matters in Romans versus like when Paul opposes Peter to his face because he wasn't living in step with the gospel, you know, like what if some of these issues, we don't agree on what category they're in? Like, someone's like, this is a gospel, this is about the gospel. Someone's like, well, maybe not, you know? Like, how do we, how do we like think about that, you know? Um, where, you know, something's not like explicitly commanded or explicitly prohibited, but like maybe it's not wise or that whole concept of like Christian freedom versus that. So I've been thinking, I'm just kind of curious about that and how we think about that. Yeah, I, I think asking the question is the goal of what Romans is like trying to get us to in Romans 14 and 15, because um, it's in the asking of the question that we start to get to what happens. The, I think the problem is a lot of times we tend not to even ask the question and just assume everything's in this top tier gospel level. And I do think it calls us to be careful with how we speak. I, I notice a lot on like Christian blogs or Christian podcasts, people throw this phrase around all the time. It's a gospel issue. And I think what we need to be careful to distinguish is this is something that flows from the gospel and has implications of gospel-centered living, implications of them, like Christian life, versus this is part and parcel Galatians 2 with the gospel itself. And so how do we think about that? It's a process of growing and understanding there are probably three tiers of categories of importance of issues. Tier one being what are true gospel issues. And those are the things primarily, like you could just think, what are the creeds? These are the things that Christians throughout the centuries have, have agreed upon about the nature of God, the nature of Christ, what it means to be a Christian. Then there's like tier two, which are really important things and that usually help us. If we believe differently about them, it can be hard to worship together, although not impossible to worship together. But things like the nature of baptism, is that something that we do for infants? Is that something that that happens for believers? Um, what are some other tier two things? Do you have any in mind? Baptism's a big one. Um, Cessationism and the yeah. spiritual gifts. You know, these are things Christians can believe differently. If you, we, we believe on that based on what we see scripture saying, and it's going to be hard in a church if you believe it should be practiced one way to then have that practice happening in the church. But we're still under the guise of believers together if we're um, believing the gospel. And then there's third tier, which are really the Romans 14, Romans 15 issues, which are it's where wisdom factors in. It's the Christian life things of, I believe in the gospel. We're united in these things as we worship together. And then on the ground, we're living these out in various ways. And there's all kinds of room for Christian liberty on those things. Um, so growing in what goes into what tier 
is important. And people will answer that differently. And for some people, um, they view things that really we would say are in tier two or tier three, and they say, no, that's, that's a number one thing, and I need to go to a different church or something like that. And we can understand that as well. Do you have any thoughts on that? Or? Yeah, I mean, the Galatians 2 passage, um, you know, they're, it, they're talking, you know, it's dealing with food and that kind of thing, but in a different way than Romans 14, 15. Romans 14 and 15, it's, it's more the question is, um, can a Christian eat certain foods or not? In Galatians 2, you have Peter, basically, Peter and Barnabas, um, separating from Gentile Christians. So basically saying, I'm going to treat you as if you're not a brother or sister in the Lord because of, um, because you, you eat food that, that I wouldn't eat. So that, that's where like Galatians 2 is the gospel issue because they're saying, this is essentially saying, I'm going to separate from you, treat you as an outsider. Whereas Romans 14, 15, sounds like the people were tempted to think like that at times, but it is more of a question and of just, you know, is this allowable or not? Not, you're not a Christian if, if you think differently. If that's a topic you're interested in exploring, Gavin Ortland has a book called Finding the Right Hills to Die On, <laughs> which I think is just a great title. Not every hill is a hill to die on. And it's just how do we strengthen those muscles of, of seeing those things in that way? But I think just asking the question is great. Um, and, and being wary of people drawing dividing lines on things that go beyond kind of creedal Christian things and saying there's no way a Christian could ever think this. Thanks, Mike. That was great. Anyone else? What's been helpful to you about Romans? You, um, What's been encouraging? Yes, Bruce. Oh, sorry. And then, do we have the? <laughs> okay. This would have been real helpful this week for me. <laughs> so, um, because the comment you made, Ryan, about um, fish. In the water and not being big enough is you know when you talk about um you know like i just went through a week of like crazy deadlines and then on top of it my computer quit working and and so i feel these deadlines just you know causing more pressure and it's just like there's nothing i could do about it i mean i did the best i could but uh you know to just be able to sit back and have this perspective of uh of you know, really what God calls me to, which is, which is the peace that he gives, you know, instead of being sucked into these things and seeing life through that, you know, so anyway, I, I just really appreciate this study and how it really applies to our lives, you know, day to day when you're dealing with stuff like that or anything. Yeah. Yeah. So, so just a comment. Uh, anyway, I guess as I'm saying that, what do either of you or both of you find is helpful when you find yourself in those situations, you know? Still trying to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, just uh, I'm see, trying to see the problem through what it is, like, first of all, realizing I'm experiencing something that's causing me angst or frustration or my computer's not working or whatever. Um, where is this coming from? And then what, what is true from scripture about that? And it, it takes us back to what has, what has Jesus' life, death, and resurrection brought to bear on this situation? And it's, oh, even though my computer's not working, God's plans are not thwarted, you know, and there's a way I can pursue the peace that he gives in the midst of it and then try and respond out of an overflow of that to other people around me. So just, it's just going back to the gospel. But as Ryan said, we're figuring it out and it's not easy. Like that can sound like a simple answer, right? But yeah. something uh, just real practical for me, I love the outdoors. So I find that when I'm getting maybe overwhelmed by a situation or, or I feel like everything's falling apart, I find that I'm usually too close to the situation. I find that I'm indoors and just, you know, my world has shrunk 
And if I just step outside, breathe the fresh air, you know, it's been sunny, not today, but it was sunny a little bit this week. It's like, oh yeah, okay. There's a, there's a God in heaven who's in control. There's this, there's a world that's bigger than my little problem. And anyway, that, that just, it's like that, that move from indoors to outdoors, it, it just reminds me to, to kind of lift my eyes up and see the bigger perspective. Elise, did you have something? It's the microphone. Great. So first of all, thank you so much, both of you, for the immense work you've done over the last year and whatever, 42 <laughs> sermons. 42. Yeah. <laughs> uh, At least it's an even thank number. you. Thank you for your study. It, it was so refreshing for my soul personally, I'm sure for everybody else who was here. So thank you. Um, to me, the thing that was most surprising was 14 and 15. Um, I think I've spent a lot of time in the rest of the book, but 14 and 15 was surprising to me in, especially in the thought of welcoming the other. And um, seeing other people, people who hold different second or third tier views than me and welcoming them. As, uh, as a sister or brother in Christ was particularly helpful for me um, and, and having proximity to people who hold other views has been really good. Um, and then how that flows into 16, that here's Paul, he's doing the, that very thing. He's welcoming the other, you know, the slave, the woman, whomever, people that he in that in that culture would not necessarily have been welcoming toward so for me I think I said one time to I think it was to you Craig I said oh I can't wait to get to 16 and you said to me yeah but there's 14 and 15 and it was like <laughs> oh yeah wait a minute 14 and 15 and I had never seen it so thank you thank you for that just learning to welcome the other thanks Kevin? What I appreciate about Romans is how, how thoroughly it answers the questions that I've come up against as I grow in Christ. And like early on, I think I ran up against, am I a sinner? Am I a little bit of a sinner or am I a thorough sinner? Um, should I just work harder to try to be right with God? Well, well what's God's answer to this? Well, um, should I mix what my answer was with his answer? Well, if I'm changed, um, should I just now view sin? How should I view sin? Should I regard it lightly? Well, if I'm changed, why do I still struggle with sin? And then what do I do about the sin that's being done against me and the sin that I see all around in the world? And what's God's plan in the big picture? You know, why is, what's this whole arc of history about? What is he bringing to consummation? And then he comes to, you know, how do we rightly live before God? And then how do we rightly live with each other? And it's just so systematic. And uh, it settles those things in th that um, with God's wisdom so that I don't have to... Um, you have a sure answer for these things. I think that's what's so helpful about it. That's great. Yeah, it, it really, as one book, contains a lot of uh, answers to things we wonder about. Helps us reframe questions of what the real question is, like you were saying, too. It's really good. Anyone else? If you found helpful, encouraging... We don't mind silence. Yeah. Silence can be helpful. <laughs> A 
Amen. Do you have the microphone? Great. Um, what I found helpful for me is Romans always a good book to reflect on the whole gospel. Whenever I find it was a good reminder for me, like <clears throat> I, I find myself having a like a block, like I finish a, a part of the Bible and then I'm stuck. I don't know where to go again. And Romans is always a good one after we just went through it. I said, man, it's just, it covers everything almost. And it's always just a good book when you're stuck, don't know where to start again. It's for me, it was always a good book to reflect on everything. Hmm. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. If all you had for some reason, if all you had was the book of Romans, you'd be in pretty good shape. Does anyone like chapter eight? <laughs> when you ask me like, what's encouraging to you about Romans, that, that still is a huge answer. We're talking about doing, we'll, we'll give it a little bit, but doing a series in Romans eight, just cause there's Who's so Who's in favor of a, a sermon series through Romans eight? Okay. Cool. Not a lot, but some. <laughs> Have we told them what the next sermon series will be? I don't think so. It's like a, Anyhow, uh, after, after Holy Week, and then we have study planning month coming up in April, and so we'll get to hear from various um, preachers from other churches in here, but um, in May, we plan to go through, first and se starting in May, going through First and Second Samuel with the life of David, so moving into narrative now, uh, as we've you know, been working, we've all been working hard in an epistle, right? We, we came to the end, what were you just saying the other day about like, uh, just the intricacy of it, it'll be nice for like. I love Romans. I love Paul. But after over a year working through the letter, it'll be nice to, to he's so, his arguments are so dense and uh, it'll be nice to go to narrative yeah. and just a change of pace. So we've all earned a breather as we dive into some of the be most beautiful stories of scripture for um, five years, we thought. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just seeing. Whoa. <laughs> Piper's like, five years, my life. Yeah, anyhow, anyhow, great. Anyone else? Something, we have just a few moments left, but it's great hearing from you what you appreciate, how God has used his word for you. Anyone? Yeah, Pat. Just one second. Let's, if coming. we could just get the mic, sorry. <laughs> So this doesn't have to do exactly with that, but okay. in, in defense of hymns, <laughs> you were saying, it, 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 and you picked out some of the hymns that are like a little bit um, maybe non-biblical. Yeah. But I think, um, like you said, it's, it's poetic language, and there are things like, um, you know, talking about another world. But this this will be another world. I mean, you know, God's gonna. This will be new. Uh, it will be heaven on earth, but it will be heaven a new heaven and earth. So it's not exactly wrong to 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 say we'll be leaving this earth. And when when Christ told the criminal on the cross next to him, "Today you will be with me in paradise." Well, mm -hmm. where's that? That's not here on earth. Right. So there will be this temp this temporary time when we are separated from our bodies. Yeah. Um, so, so I think we can look at some of the hymns that way too and go, well, maybe not be, some we definitely can be critical of, mm -hmm. but maybe not be too critical of some of them because, um, even the all fly away, I, when, when Jesus rose, um, it, it may have looked like he was flying up mm -hmm. into the sky, you know, and he's, he's going to call us up. We're going to meet him in the air. Mm -hmm. Well, we can use the terms of flying maybe. So I thought, well, let's. Let's not be too critical of some of those hymns, but um, yeah, there are some that definitely um, aren't biblical. Yeah, I think it's often what they don't say that is, is a problem. So you get a lot of this language and it's not paired with a robust doctrine of new creation. And so the average Christian is, they never hear anything else. And so that's where they can be misleading. I, I agree. There's poetic language, lots of poetic license, but um, often that's about as far as we get. 
Yeah, having the good theology to then hear the poetic language rightly is, is a big deal. And so that's really great. I was just reading this week, Robert Lethem, systematic theologian, he was saying he sometimes takes his congregation to certain hymns or songs and says, okay, let's practice this. Is there anything here that's actually like heresy? Because that's a problem. <laughs> is there anything that's just an error or could be like said differently or is incomplete in what it's saying? And that's a good practice for us to always be thinking through with things that we hear is there's always um, more to it, especially when poetic language is giving something so terse. Um, we may need to fill it out with other things from our biblical knowledge. All right. Should we do one more or wrap it up? Burn, just one moment. There you go. Uh, this is Romans 15, 5, and 6. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another, according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's a very fitting place to end. That's where Paul was really building to, that we together with one voice could be glorifying the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so um, we get to do that. So um, do you want to close in prayer or me? Or? Go ahead. Okay. I'll, I'll close in prayer and then we can fellowship and then we'll come back together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for um, your word. It's rich to, as your people, just reflect upon um, what you have revealed about yourself and about your plan of salvation and how truly big that is. We pray that you'd continue to stretch our minds and our hearts to understand um, what no eye has seen or ear has heard about this glory that awaits us. Uh, that Jesus has earned for us. Um, encourage us with that and also bring it down into our day in, day out existence that we would be depending upon you by the Spirit to bring this new creation life more and more fully into our lives. Help us to um, more and more delight in the salvation that's broken in upon us and more and more long for the fullness of it one day. Thank you that all these things uh, we can be sure of because of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.